Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to an intriguing journey through the history of Pirates of the Caribbean as we delve into the remarkable life story of a man who left an indelible mark on the world of piracy and colonial expansion, Lord Cutler Beckett. Born into privilege and wielding immense power, Beckett's life was a tapestry of ambition, cunning strategy, and an unyielding determination and cruelty. From his early days in the heart of the British Empire to his pivotal role in the Caribbean during the Age of Piracy, this video will unravel the enigmatic personality behind the man who sought to bring order to the chaos of the seas and reshape the course of history. Cutler Beckett was born to Jonathan Beckett Sr. and an unknown woman in the late 1680s. He grew up as the youngest of four children, two older brothers, Jonathan Jr. and Bartholomew, and his older sister, Jane. Jonathan Sr. was the director of the Beckett Trading Company, one of the five most successful merchant organizations in England. From his earliest days, Cutler was fascinated by literature, history, geography, showing far greater intelligence than his two older brothers. Of course, this would translate to his later years as he became an expert in the occult, seeing it as a potential new source of power. At age eight, Cutler was the top of his class, surpassing all other children his age. This drew ire from his peers after they brutally beat him his teacher, Angus McFarlane, offered him private tutoring sessions. Angus took note of Cutler's imagination and gifted him a copy of a book called My Life Among the Pirates, written by Captain J. Ward. Among the many nautical legends spoken of in the book, young Beckett was particularly interested in the legend of Zezura, a mythical city in the island of Kerma, being a cultural mirror to the ancient cities of Egypt. According to the book, the island was hidden by an unnatural fog and inhabited by the ancient Cushites that fled Egypt and Cush a millennia prior. Over the years, young Cutler Beckett continued his studies, eventually being accompanied by his sister Jane. While Beckett and his sister were close, and his sickly mother still loved him, Cutler was never appreciated by his father and his older brothers, seeing him as a useless addition to the family. Cutler had the dream of becoming an admiral or a general, so he'd be referred to as Sir Cutler Beckett believing that if he had a title that no man in his family had before, his father would finally respect him. When Cutler turned 18, he was already an exceptionally well-educated young man, studying in the works of Newton and dreaming of becoming a professor himself. He expected to be easily accepted into Cambridge or Oxford University, but instead he elected to travel the world before dedicating himself to further studying. One day, Jonathan Sr. asked Cutler what he'd do with his life, and Cutler responded, saying that he was interested in joining his brothers as part of the Beckett Trading Company. Jonathan believed that Cutler wasn't suited for business, so he wanted Beckett to become a clergyman. Beckett didn't believe in any higher powers, so he refused the offer. Jonathan told Cutler about his sick mother and how her final wish was supposedly seeing young Cutler as a clergyman. Cutler was furious when he heard that, accusing his father of infecting his mother with smallpox after sleeping with dozens of prostitutes in his spare time. From this point forth, Jonathan despised Cutler, so Cutler decided to abandon his family altogether. Jane overheard this fight and gave him her life savings in the hopes that he'd settle down somewhere and that he'll help her leave as well. After leaving his family behind, Cutler headed for London, where he was employed by the East India Trading Company. He worked at their head office for a number of months, becoming known as a great corporate executive. His superiors assigned him to a tour of duty at their office in Gibraltar. Cutler jumped at the opportunity, believing he could finally fulfill his dreams of seeing the world. But off the coast of Spain, the ship he was aboard was captured by the French pirate Christophe Julien de Rapier. Cutler, still being somewhat immature, mocked de Rapier by saying his clothes were out of fashion in both London and Paris. De Rapier let his crew torture Beckett, forcing him and the rest of his peers to clean the ship, and if they fell behind, they'd be brutally whipped. Still furious with Cutler, Jonathan didn't want to pay the ransom which drove Cutler to attempt suicide. At the last minute, Lord Reginald Marmaduke Bracegirl Penwallow sent the ransom for Cutler, and Captain de Rapier freed Cutler. This event haunted Beckett for the rest of his life, driving him to have an undying hatred for pirates. Upon reaching Gibraltar, Cutler wrote a letter to Penwallow in thanks for saving his life, and the East India Company for having faith in him. Beckett promised to pay back the ransom, and he continued his work for the company in Bristol. Beckett rose rapidly through the company over the next few years and eventually was stationed to work at Nippon in the port of Edo. Cutler remained in contact with Jane through his entire career to this point, and now that he was well established, he wanted her to live with him, but didn't want her to take the six-month voyage to the other side of the world in order to do so. During their exchange of letters, 
Cutler came to learn that his mother had died and promised his sister that she could join him at his next posting. While stationed in Edo, Beckett employed many operatives around different foreign ports to keep an eye on developments. He created a network of spies, all funneling information back to him, eventually meeting a former spy of the British Crown named Gates, who acted as his lead spy in Edo. At some unknown point, Gates was killed in Edo while he was on a mission. After three years of working in Nippon, Beckett was relocated to Calabar in West Africa, where he became the director of West African Affairs for the East India Company. Upon arriving in Calabar, Beckett immediately hired Ian Mercer to be his leading enforcer and spy, replacing Gates. Once he arrived in Calabar, Beckett received a letter from his cousin Susan, who informed him that his sister had died from a fever. Cutler had changed over the course of his career, becoming so cold-hearted that he didn't even mourn her. All he wanted was a title, so he could return to Somersetshire to see his father giving him a cut direct, which was a form of public snubbing. Beckett wasted no time establishing himself in the growing European community in the area, creating a small side business of light-skinned concubines with a clientele of rich European men. Beckett asked for no money, as he believed that having wealthy men who owe him favors, requiring his discretion and silence, was a very, very valuable tool. Beckett was soon after visited by his immediate supervisor, Lord Penwallow. Over the next ten days, Penwallow stayed with Beckett as his guest, and informed the young official that he had contacts in the court of King George and the East India Company top management. Once Penwallow left, Beckett saw his opportunity to get the title of Lord Cutler Beckett. At an unknown point during Beckett's time as a director, he bought an old ship called the Wicked Wench. He wanted to use it as a slave ship at first, but the shipwrights explained that converting the ship to export slaves would be too expensive, so it was used to export other form of cargo. One day, an East India Company brig returned to Calabar from a voyage without its captain. The first and second mates explained to Beckett that their ship had been attacked by pirates and the leader of the pirate crew was a woman named Donna Pirata. The captain was killed because he spoke out against the ship being captained by a woman, and the first mate of the brig called for parley with the captain, negotiating for their freedom at the expense of one-third of the ship's rum supply. The next day, Beckett invited this young first mate into his office after examining the brig's logbook. Being impressed by the young man's quick wit and creativity under pressure, he offered the first mate a position as captain of a slave ship. This, of course, was none other than the legendary Captain Jack Sparrow, who accepted the promotion to captain but refused to transport slaves. Beckett agreed that while the sale of slaves wasn't an ideal practice, Beckett was driven by profit above all else. Beckett understood that Jack would be a great operative in foreign ports, so he humored Jack to try and coerce him into service as a slave ship captain. He offered Jack the Wicked Wench, which Jack accepted. Some months later, Jack returns from a voyage aboard the Wicked Wench while Lord Penwallow was visiting Beckett's home in Calabar, where Jack was tasked with transporting building materials for Penwallow's new plantation in the Bahamas. Soon after, Ian Mercer discovered that Jack helped a slave named Chamba escape captivity from the greedy portsmaster, and instead of angering Beckett, this news convinced Beckett that Jack could be even more of a valuable asset. As part of his never-ending fascination with the ancient world, Beckett bought some golden jewelry with designs that matched descriptions of ancient Zerzuran patterns he recalled from his childhood studies. Noticing how they didn't look to be ancient, he believed that the lost city could actually be real. Beckett was told by the seller that the jewelry was bought from a slave trader. Beckett sent Mercer to find him. When the trader was found, Beckett questioned him about the jewelry, and he explained that the slaves were found in the interior of Africa, to which Beckett believed were from Kerma. Beckett sent Mercer to find two slaves of the same regional origin, and once they were found, Mercer interrogated the older of the two who died due to unknown circumstances. Beckett feared that the same would happen to the younger slave woman, so he didn't have Mercer interrogate her. Beckett found them to be useless anyway since they couldn't speak English, so he waited for Jack to return from his voyage so he could have Jack seduce her into revealing where she's from. Beckett offered Jack 20% of the gold he found, since the myth was that Kerma had a labyrinth of gold and 10% of the money from Kerman slaves. Jack continued to refuse trading slaves, so Beckett let Jack have 30% of the gold. To make sure Jack would return with the young slave woman after finding Kermit and make sure Jack followed through on his agreements, Beckett warned Jack that he'd be branded as a pirate if he fell out of line. Along with this, Mercer planted a spy on board the wench to report back to Mercer once the ship returned. After Jack set out to find the island of Kerma and the city of Zerzura, Beckett and Mercer assembled a small military force for an invasion of the legendary island. Soon after, Penwala requested Beckett to send 200 slaves to his new plantation, and he wanted Jack to transport them because of how well he transported the building materials months earlier. 
Panuelo also told Beckett that if he managed to successfully carry through on this deal, Beckett could officially be recognized by the king for his work with the company, finally earning the title of Lord. Once the Wicked Wench returned from her voyage, she was badly damaged with only a fraction of the crew aboard. The young slave woman was missing, and Jack told Beckett the story he couldn't even believe. Jack claimed that the young woman refused to tell Jack anything until he helped her brother escape slavery in the Bahamas, and after successfully doing so, the ship was attacked by rogue pirates, and Jack fended off the pirates. Then, once the rogues were defeated, the same female captain from the earlier that year, Donna Pirata, helped save the wench from sinking and escorted the ship to Savannah, Georgia. Once the wench was repaired, they sailed near Kerma, but an unnatural fog caused the whole crew to fall asleep, and once they woke up, the slave woman and her brother were missing, along with one of the longboats. Beckett knew Jack was lying about something, so he had the entire crew interviewed one at a time, all telling the same story. The spy planted aboard the wench was the only one with additional information, telling Mercer that Jack was very secretive during the voyage. Beckett then personally discussed this with Jack, and Jack showed Beckett the scars he got from the voyage as proof. Beckett still didn't believe Jack, so to make Jack pay for his failure, Beckett tasked Jack with transporting 200 slaves to Penwallow's plantation. Jack immediately tried to resign his position, but Beckett informed Jack that if he tried to resign or if he refused to transport the cargo, Jack would owe the company for all the lost fortunes from his previous voyages, which Jack was absolutely not capable of paying off. To further entice Jack to follow through on transporting the slaves, Beckett told Jack that if he succeeded, Jack could buy the Wicked Wench for one shilling, so Jack finally agreed to Beckett's terms. Once the cargo hold was fitted to hold slaves, Beckett sent slave handlers to staff the ship. As the wench made her voyage to the New World, Beckett secretly had his fleet trail behind Jack to make sure he didn't try and deviate from his task. The fleet were ordered to attack the wench if she went anywhere near the fog bank where the Kermans disappeared. And as to be expected, Jack came close to the island, so the fleet attacked the wench, and the crew surrendered without a fight. Once the East India Company troops attempted to board, they noticed all the slaves had disappeared. Sparrow was locked in the brig of the flagship of the fleet, and it was returned to Calabar and thrown in jail. Beckett was told by Penwallow that his chance of becoming a lord was ruined by Jack's betrayal, so he punished Jack by destroying the Wicked Wench. Ian Mercer took an iron rod with the P symbol, which Beckett took from him and branded Jack in his right arm. Then, Beckett had the wench burned and sunk. As Jack attempted to escape, Beckett grabbed a cutlass to try and stop him, but Jack knocked it out of his hand and threw him overboard. Beckett had believed that Captain Jack Sparrow went down with his ship soon after. Little did Beckett know that Jack spoke an incantation that summoned Davy Jones, the Lord of the Sea, and struck a deal with him to retrieve the sunken wench, reborn as the Black Pearl. Beckett's quest for the title of Lord was greatly slowed down, but over time he continued to serve the company well. After returning to London from Calabar, Beckett met with Weatherby Swan, a good friend of King George I. Beckett continued to climb the ranks, eventually becoming the supreme head of the company, and soon after, knighted and made a lord, and duly appointed representative of King George II. Once he was granted this position, his goals changed. He set his sights on eradicating piracy from the Seven Seas. To do this, he sought the dead man's chest to try and take command of Davy Jones himself. At some point after this, he became aware that Jack had actually survived, and was in command of the reborn wench, now the Black Pearl and Jack was searching for the lost treasure of the Isla de Muerta. Beckett also learned that Jack was now in possession of a magical compass that leads the user to whatever they want most. One year after the Battle of Isla de Muerta, Cutler Beckett arrived at Port Royal, establishing himself as the new leader of the colony, supplanting Governor Weatherby Swan and arresting his daughter Elizabeth and her fiancé Will Turner on their wedding day for assisting in the escape of Captain Jack Sparrow. Beckett struck a deal with Will, requesting that if he returns to Port Royal with Jack's compass, he and Elizabeth would be set free and Jack would be a privateer for the crown. And if he fails, he and Elizabeth would face the gallows. Soon after, Beckett discovered that Governor Weatherby Swan intended to send Elizabeth back to London. Since she was the only reason Will was even on his quest, Beckett sent Mercer to intercept them, having him kill Captain Hawkins. Mercer tried to arrest Elizabeth, but since she was nowhere to be found, he arrested Governor Swan instead. As it turned out, Elizabeth snuck into Beckett's office, holding Beckett at gunpoint to force him to legitimize the letters of Mark, and she made her escape. Expecting Elizabeth to try and free Will, Beckett sent Mercer to Tortuga. Beckett confronted Governor Swan and told Swan that Jack and the Black Pearl crew would be hunted down and killed, right after Mercer reported that he saw Elizabeth leave Tortuga with James Norrington and Jack. In hopes of securing safety for Elizabeth, Weatherby pledged his loyalty to Beckett. 
After Jack's voyage to Isla Cruces, where he and the Black Pearl died to the Kraken, former Commodore James Norrington arrived at Beckett's office with the heart of Davy Jones, and he was immediately reinstated and promoted. Beckett made quick work and had Jones kill the Kraken, so it couldn't be used against the company. Over the next few months, Beckett and his fleet hunted down and exterminated all pirates in the seas. He imposed martial law on all the Caribbean territories, suspending all the rights of everyday citizens, and held a mass execution of anybody caught in association with pirates, including children. During one of the executions, the crowd began to sing Hoist the Colors, the anthem of the Brethren Court, which was a call for the pirate lords to convene, leaving them open to be destroyed once and for all. Beckett had the surviving Black Pearl crew tracked to Singapore, where the East India Company troops ambushed Sal Fang's bathhouse. Beckett was then informed that the crew of the Black Pearl were attempting to free Captain Jack Sparrow from Davy Jones's locker. Beckett had also become irritated that under his control, Jones was slaughtering pirates without showing any mercy, as Beckett wanted prisoners to interrogate. As punishment, Beckett had Jones's heart placed aboard the Dutchman so Jones could feel pain from being within its proximity, and had the heart guarded by two mini cannons and multiple troops at the ready, but keeping Jones alive for his knowledge of the seas. Governor Swan began to ask too many questions about the heart, so Beckett had Swan murdered in secret, and all the associates of Swan, such as Norrington, were informed that he returned to England. Once Jack was freed, Beckett made a deal with Sal Fang to exchange Jack for the Black Pearl, but promised that Beckett had no intention of keeping. His goal was to uncover the significance behind the nine pieces of eight. Beckett and Jack met, and Jack explained everything to Beckett in exchange for his survival. Beckett tells Jack that he has the magical compass, questioning if he even needs Jack. But Jack points out that it points to what he wants most, which isn't the Brethren Court, but instead, Jack Sparrow dead. Beckett points out that he could just kill Jack and find Shipwreck Cove on his own, cutting out the middleman. Jack explained that it would be impossible to invade the Cove, so Beckett's only option would be to use Jack to drive out the Brethren. Jack escaped, along with the Pearl and Sal Fang's crew aboard the Empress, and Beckett instructed the Dutchman to follow Sal Fang while he followed the Pearl. During Jack's escape, he crippled the main mass of the Endeavor, setting Beckett back by hours. On the trail of the Pearl, Beckett noticed that there were bodies thrown into the ocean as a breadcrumb trail. Eventually, Beckett found Will Turner thrown overboard the Pearl, and brought him in for questioning. Jones was summoned to join Will and Beckett as they had tea, and questioned Jones about the sea goddess Calypso. Beckett knew that the pirates had Calypso with them, so he wanted to extract all information he could get from Jones due to his extensive knowledge of nautical lore. Beckett discovered that it was Jones himself who showed the first Brethren Court how to bind her in human form, and Will told them that the Brethren intended on freeing Calypso, and agreed to lead them to Shipwreck Cove on the agreement that his father would be freed and Elizabeth would be unharmed. Beckett agreed, and gave Will the compass to lead them. As Beckett expected, Jack led the pirates out of the cove, and met with the now pirate king Elizabeth Swan in parley, warning her to surrender or they'll all be killed, telling her that if they comply, only most of them will die. Beckett returned to his fleet, and ordered them to be ready for the attack. Unbeknownst to Beckett, the Brethren had successfully freed Calypso, and as such, an unnatural wind began to form, as a giant maelstrom appeared between the two warring fleets. Beckett set the Dutchman to battle the Pearl, but the battle resulted in the death of Davy Jones and Will Turner succeeding him as captain. The Flying Dutchman rose from the depths, and with the help of the Black Pearl, the two ships surrounded the Endeavor and opened fire on her. Beckett was utterly dumbfounded by his defeat, feeling utterly hopeless. He spoke his last words. And with the death of Cutler Beckett, the East India Trading Company retreated from the Caribbean, signaling a new era of freedom. Thank you all so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to like and subscribe. Comment down below on your thoughts on Cutler Beckett. What about his life story is most surprising to you? What's your favorite scene with him? Also, join my Discord server if you'd like to chat one-on-one -on -one with me about the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, Indiana Jones, theme parks, or movies in general. I'd be happy to have you all aboard. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you all have a great day.